Good morning and welcome to PAC's program on legends and leaders. I'm Dean Miller, the president and CEO of PACT, and we welcome you to this morning's program, which is sponsored by Fairmount Partners. This is the unofficial lead into to the Enterprise Awards. And uh, I'll give a few details on that in a minute, but our close partnership with Fairmount Partners goes back a long period of time. Uh, they have been uh, the title sponsor of the Enterprise Awards uh, for more than a decade and a close partner to many entrepreneurs. As, as many of you know, and if you don't, they are one of the leading middle market investment banks, not just in, in this area, but in the country, uh, have completed over 250 transactions, over $13 billion in value. Uh, last year, they had a record year. You might be surprised by that, but in COVID, they had a record year uh, and particularly from an M&A perspective, uh, and it was capped off by their sale for $700 million of local company and packed success story, AGI, to ANSYS. Uh, and so we're excited to partner and continue to partner with Fairmount Partners on the Enterprise Awards and in this program in particular. Uh, the Enterprise Awards is coming up, as many of you know, and we're putting right now in the chat links to the two programs that are going to happen next week. Um, and so next week on, on Tuesday, June 29th, we will have an in-person, that's right, in-person celebration, three hours from 6 to 9 p.m. at Springfield Country Club Outdoors on the patio, an opportunity for you to connect, connect for the first time perhaps in many months, if not a year plus, with your fellow technologists, life sciences leaders, et cetera. We look forward to, to having you join us. Again, the link is in chat right now to register for that. The following day on June 30th at 4.30 p.m., we will debut the awards program, which is a virtual presentation of the Enterprise Awards where you can find out about not just all the finalists, but the winners. So we hope that you're able to join us for both of those programs. Again, the links are in chat right now for you to register for Tuesday as well as for the Wednesday program that's virtual. So without further ado, let me progress to the, this program and introduce Alan Bourne, uh, who's a director with Fairmount Partners. And remind you that this is a webcast um, and uh, please stay on mute, but use the chat function to ask any questions. Um, <clears throat> Alan, you've uh, been a, certainly a terrific supporter of, of the PACT organization, the PACT community. Alan serves on the board of PACT um, but also entrepreneurs. And uh, as we look you know, to building that next generation, the wisdom of our leaders, of our legends uh, is really important. Uh, and you've been an, an important steward in that regard in, in particular with this program. So welcome. Thanks, Dean. Appreciate it. Uh, and thanks, uh, thanks everyone for, for joining us. So today it's, it's my pleasure to welcome four business leaders uh, two winners of the PACT Legend Lifetime Achievement Award, and two CEOs who are each finalists for PACT CEO of the Year, which Dean noted is going to be announced at next week's Enterprise Awards. And if you're not registered for that, I'd encourage you to, to do so. And, and I would also encourage you to, you know, to, to join the thing on, on Tuesday night, um, on the 29th, the in-person event, which, which I am really, really looking forward to. It's going to be great to, to shake hands with folks again. Um, so today we're going to talk about uh, the, the past 15 months, or a little bit about that, but we're going to spend most of our time talking about the challenges and opportunities that, that lie ahead. So let me introduce my panelists. Uh, we've got Mike DiPiano is managing and general partner, or managing general partner and co-founder of New Spring Capital. Maria Machicchini is founder, CEO, and executive board member for Anovis Bio. John Martinson is chairman of Martinson Ventures and founder of Edison Partners. And Madhu Natarajan is co-founder and CEO of Odessa. So welcome everybody. Um, so first let's, uh, let's start by taking a few minutes if we could uh, to, to talk a little bit about, about your organizations and, and where you focus and, 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 and the types of works that you do. So maybe we'll start with, um, with Mike. Can you talk a little bit about New Spring? Sure, New Spring Capital, uh, 21 years uh, since we founded it, has five distinct uh, investment products or strategies. We have the growth strategy, which focuses on companies that are growing rapidly, often in uh, fields and technology. 
uh, including software as a service, e-commerce, tech-enabled services, things of that nature. Uh, we have a credit product, uh, which uh, lends money to companies that are now profitable, uh, still growing, uh, maybe not wanting to have equity in their, in their uh, capital structure and are looking for a debt product. We have uh, healthcare, which focuses on growing healthcare companies uh, in, in IT, services, et cetera. Uh, we have a, a buyout vehicle called New Spring Holdings. And most recently, we launched a consumer-facing distributed business uh, investment product uh, called New Spring Franchise. Uh, all of those attempt to partner with entrepreneurs uh, in the region and, and, and broadly in, in other places uh, to help them grow and, and prosper their businesses. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Mike. Maria, can you tell us a little bit about Anovis Bio? Sure. Um, I'm the CEO and founder of Anovis, and our approach to neurodegeneration, specifically Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease, is very novel and very different. So for a while, we had some problems raising money and with credibility, because if you propose something that nobody has heard of, you really need to prove that it is correct. Well, in the last two years, we have raised enough money to do two phase two studies. These are studies in patients, one group of Alzheimer's disease and the other group of Parkinson's disease. And we have shown in both disease indications that our drug in one case improves cognition and in the other case improves motor function. So we are very thankful that we hung in there and actually got enough money to test the concept. Now we want to go into phase three and develop a drug for the market. That's great, thank you. And as, uh, as someone who's, whose mother died from, from Alzheimer's and my, my uncle as well, uh, appreciate the work that, that, that you all are doing. Um, John, so let's, uh, let's, let's turn to you. Can you talk a little bit about, about Martinson Ventures and, and where you focus? Sure. After uh, phasing out of Edison Partners about five years ago, I uh, started deploying my own capital. I've been investing on my own for about 25 years, but uh, we have a small team, uh, but a pretty large scope. Uh, we're investing in early stage uh, companies, mostly in uh, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, uh, some later stage venture and a, a fair amount of small buyouts uh, also uh, partnering with uh, funds. Uh, we're investor in uh, uh, 25 funds at this point and uh, really enjoy working uh, with those uh, GPs. And I have a pretty good view of the overall uh, market from that point. Um, invest uh, uh, significantly in uh, digital health uh, ed tech and broadly within software. Also uh, look to invest in uh, secondaries where uh, uh, founders or um, our investors need uh, liquidity in the companies going forward. Uh, recently started investing in quali qualified opportunity zone projects as, as well. And uh, I couldn't be more excited about the prospects for our industry going forward. Awesome, thanks, John. Madhu? Hi everyone, I'm Madhu Natarajan. I'm a CEO and co-founder of, of Odessa. We're, we're essentially a, a platform company that provides uh, technology to the asset finance industry. So asset finance is essentially um, anything CapEx related, anything that a business needs um, to run, to operate, right? So um, our customers provide that financing. So there are large financial institutions and banks that provide that financing. And where Odessa comes in is the technology that manage that entire process, uh, portfolio management, asset management, contract management, soup to nuts. So what is different about Odessa and how we differentiate ourselves uh, you know, as we go after this, you know, if the asset finance industry, by the way, to give you a sense of size, is more than a trillion dollars in volume in, in the US alone annually. And then when you extrapolate that out globally, that's more than four, bit, four trillion annually, that's what, that's the money that companies like us need to help manage, right? So, so um, what differentiates us, what distinguishes Odessa and, and how we go to market is that we, we take that word platform pretty seriously and not just as, as, as a fancy sounding uh, uh, substitute uh, for euphemism for, for technology, but rather we've positioned ourselves as, as essentially most analogous to Salesforce. Um, so the Salesforce of our industry. So instead of creating 
the car. We created the factory in which that car was produced. Um, so we productized that factory and the car. So, uh, so that's our claim to fame here, and that's our distinguishing factor, and that's the reason why we're probably the fastest growing in our in our industry compared to our, our peer group globally. And uh, pretty excited to be on that trajectory. Uh, we're at about thousand people uh, in, in total strength, and uh, we're, we're growing at about thirty uh, percent on our revenue year on year. So, awesome. Uh, so that's Odessa. Awesome. Great. Well, thank you. Um, so, so as we kick off the discussion for, for the folks in the audience, if you have any questions for the panelists, there's a couple of ways to, to get those questions answered. So one, you can, can use the chat function, or two, there's a Q&A function that is at the bottom of your screen, and we'll be monitoring those, and, and we'll, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll bring up the, your questions and, and ask them to the panelists if you have any. So feel, feel free to, to, to shoot questions throughout. So first, um, let's, uh, let's get started by talking a little bit about um, the, the market over the past 15 months or 16 months at this point. So I'd love to get your perspective just, just briefly on what, it was, what you experienced between March of last year and how, and, and between March of last year and how things changed over the years and what you what you experienced for, for each of your organizations and, and, and what the experience was like for your employees and and, and, and your and your customers. So maybe maybe um, Maria, let's start with you because uh, you come at it with a little bit of a different angle as a as a as a you know a company offering a, a unique product and technology. So talk to talk to us about what your experiences were. So we had our roadshow in January of last year, which means we did a traditional roadshow. We ran around for three weeks like chickens with our heads cut off. We closed, we got the money, and then we had the final dinner, and just a week later, the market closed. Everything closed. I shouldn't say the market. I should say the world closed. And all of a sudden, we first thought, well, thankfully, we have the money because now we are not going to be able to talk to anybody. As it turns out, video, Zoom, whatever, worked beautiful. And every investor I know of was fine with talking either on the phone or in a WebEx. And so actually things for us, oh, the problem we had, we were going to start two, these two studies. And just like the world shut down, the, world shut down, the clinics were closed pretty much from three to six months. They did not, they were only taking care of COVID patients. They did not want to do a clinical study with elderly patients with comorbidities. So we couldn't start our study. We pushed and then what happened is the clinics realized they're not making any money if they're closed. So they figured out how to carve a piece of their clinic for clinical studies. They became a little bit more expensive, but they started recruiting. And that's why I would Ten months, we recruited 70 patients and we finished the study. So it was interesting how everybody adapted first to video and then to the reality of COVID that you have to keep going no matter whether there is a virus or not. That's interesting. Thank you. I'm going to come back to you because uh, I think we want to talk about tools later. And I know that virtual clinical trials are we we work with virtual clinical trials companies and and it's it's it seems to be a very hot space so i'd love to get your thoughts on sort of the future of clinical trials but but before we do that um madu how 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 has how have things changed at odessa and how how did you all experience the the pandemic sure um well i, I think well we've been remote since uh, since march of, of last year and we continue to be remote um, I think the, the gravity all of, of all of it, and I'm sure we're not alone here, kind of dawned on us you know, a couple of months into, into the pandemic. Um, how we changed really, Alan, was, was just a recognition um, of, of you know, the importance of, uh, of, of a digital culture, a company digital culture, I guess, is, is a good way to frame it up. Um, and we quickly moved to um, setting up, uh, investing in, um, um, self-care um, opportunities that would be virtual and, and uh, bolstered by um, outside consultants that we would bring in that would help with that mental health, um, career planning uh, from, a, 
one-on-one -on -one basis, more of those you know, the cadence uh, around that. It, we just became more, more, uh, more deliberate about how we how we had those kinds of discussions, um, and then setting up virtual hangouts and everything else that you know the rest of the world was also doing. But the the one thing that I think that was kind of crystallized in our minds, and I look back over the last 15 months, and I look at it as sort of a defining moment for us what was really how we started to um, look at our, our digital culture and, and the importance of it, it became a thing versus something else that a tech company also did, uh, became very central to who we are. And, and the result of that is, um, is that our productivity is actually better than it was pre-pandemic and we continue to be 100% remote. Um, so you know, our, our transition and, and again, I don't think we're, we're, we're you know, this, this experience has been unique to Odessa, but our transition was the, the logistical aspects of it were of course challenging in the beginning stages. But um, once we hit rhythm, um, actually turned out to be a pretty good. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm actually excited to see what happens next as, as, as we start opening back up. Awesome, awesome. So John, turning, turning to you um, with your, with, with your your, your portfolio companies and the investing that you that you do, how has um, how did you all experience the, the pandemic? First of all, when it, it hit, I was on a golf trip to South Africa and uh, was on en route to the safari. So it was an arduous trip to get back in time and on the last plane from uh, Cape Town that was uh, bound for the US. And all that through that period, uh, emails and calls are flying of, of what's happening to 55 companies and what the fund managers were doing. And that continued for about two weeks uh, to get, and I think our role as venture capitalists is to help settle people down and say, this will pass. We didn't really realize it was gonna be a year and a half before uh, uh, finishing, uh, but it was a, a very stressful uh, period. It came, became clear uh, about uh, three months into it uh, that this was going to be a lasting experience. At the same time, it was one uh, where customers seemed to hang in there in the software industry, didn't have that many cancellations unless they were restaurants or something like that. And so the revenue base was pretty secure, very difficult to land new clients and that's still the case today until we get back to face-to-face. -to -face. Uh, and that's, that is the, the number, number one issue. Uh, but the employees and management really stepped up. And, uh, but many companies on their own uh, cut back 10, 20% to make sure uh, they had cash flow uh, to survive and have just uh, begun to uh, rehire and, and that. So, uh, I think everything is pretty well intact. Uh, we had only one company fail out of 55 and that would have failed regardless of this uh, pandemic. So I think that's, that's a pretty remarkable uh, story. That's great, that's great. And, and Mike, um, with, with your different strategies, was there, was there different experiences among the strategies? Um, what was it like at Newspring? Yeah, uh, there really wasn't. I, I think everything that you've heard from Maria Madu and, and John pretty consistent. I, I, you know, gosh, I've been doing this now for 30 some years and it was without a doubt the most stressful, um, unpredictable time. And it happened so quickly. Uh, you, you know, John mentioned being on a golf trip. Uh, I had two partners uh, at a PGA tournament and talking about should they come home and maybe meet on the weekend. And then within 12 hours was on a flight because the whole trip's being, you know, the players championships being canceled. The speed of all of this, I think, really was quite unique. And it was coupled with real fear about people's health, right? Uh, I had a number of employees at various companies end up in the hospital for panic attacks uh, due to the fear of what was going to happen. All of those cases, by the way, were in New York City where there's a big density, et cetera. Um, and, and then I, you know, looking back a year later, I, I was, we were, we were all talking and remarking about how resilient the leaders and entrepreneurs of these businesses, and we, we own about 80 businesses, uh, parts of them were, uh, they, they didn't wait for any direction. They took the bull by the horn. Um, I had one company practicing 
uh, virtual conferences about uh, a day into the pandemic in, in February, thinking something might happen. I thought, gosh, that's interesting, having no thought that in a month everybody would be, you know, walking out of their offices. So I'm just, just really impressed with the leaders and, and the teams and how resilient they are. I think now, uh, you know, there's, we're going we're gonna to see this, this experiment or this realization of, of this virtual world and the hybrid world coming together. And, and how will it work? Um, I think it's going to place a, a tremendous amount of pressure on our leaders uh, to be able to build uh, the word that uh, Mundu used, culture, uh, throughout a distributed workforce. You know, it used to be some of us led businesses that had multiple law office locations. Uh, that's that's not very typical today. Most people are in one place. Now they're going to be in you know thousands of places, right, out of their homes. How do we how do we drive culture? Uh, and, and how do we get strategic things done? I do believe it's more efficient today um, on most tasks. The question will be, uh, do we get the, the real breakthrough thoughts done on, on you know, relationships like this? Um, I think that's yet to be seen. I've heard people think that, say that they think it will. Most I hear don't think it will, but most of those are older. <laughs> so we'll see yeah. if they're right. And I then think it's going to place a big, big uh, uh, amount of pressure on young people uh, who are being onboarded in companies and trying to find their way, trying to get trained, trying to grow and, and be mentored. Um, I think those that are assertive in asking for support, help, and mentorship will probably thrive. Uh, those that are maybe less assertive may, may challenge. Uh, and so what we're going to see live how all this works. It's going to be quite an interesting process around the world. Yeah, for sure. So, so let's let's talk about about that because I think I think sort of these new work paradigms are, are something that that I, I definitely want to get into. Um, you talked about hybrid environments and young people coming on board and the recruiting landscape. So um, Maria and Madhu, uh, I, I'd, I'd love to, to get a sense for how you all are finding recruiting and you know, when you think about your, particularly the, the junior teams, the millennials, the, the, the folks who are the up and comers, what are they looking for and what do you need to do to, to hire those types of folks? Are they looking for, is it comp, is it location, is it sort of virtual versus in the office? Is it, is it um, uh, uh, different types of, of programs? I mean, how, how has the pandemic affected recruiting for you both? Go ahead, Maria, I'll walk to you. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, Maria, why don't, you, why don't we start with you? Well, uh, to be perfectly honest, we are very virtual. We just started hiring. And I think that, so we are at the second person we are hiring after we had the positive data because basically we waited to make sure our job works in Alzheimer's and Parkinson's before putting a staff together. So we are at the second person and what I'm seeing is the excitement of being part of something that in fact works. You know, in neuroscience, nothing has worked. And even though you can find out my salary, I'm doing my job, it's depressing to be involved in something we spent three years in just to see that it didn't work. The other thing I have to say, the fact that our stock looks ridiculously hockey stick hasn't hurt. People, I think sometimes I think they care more about the fact that our stuff has gone from $3 to $100, much more so than they care about Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. The other thing is I've always been flexible. That's kind of me. So I do want to see people. I don't hire anybody I haven't seen at first. However, after that, we will have meetings. We will have parts of the work we do together, but a lot of it can be done at home on a computer. So I'm very flexible how people want to structure their, their work. And as I said, um, I haven't had a problem with salaries. I think it's because our salaries have gone down up exponentially. So it's not that we are cheap or anything. And we have stuff. I really think right now the most important thing, two things are A, the drug works, and B, the stuff is up. OK. Maru, um so being 100% virtual, you, you, you're not really dealing with, you know, do I bring folks into the office? Do we run a hybrid? But if, if I'm virtual, if I'm, a, if I'm a virtual employee, I can just hop to another employer from a click of the, you know, click of the mouse. 
right? Okay. So, so how do you think about recruiting and 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 in and in so recruiting? What tools are you providing your employees that tries to that gets them engaged and gets them involved? And how do you think about retention in a virtual environment? Sure. I mean, I, to be honest, Alan, it, it hasn't really changed too much because when when you know pre-pandemic versus you know in this new world that we're in, in that um, Odessa is always in it for the long run. So that's how we approach our employees. That's how we approach our, our prospects and, and prospective recruits, et cetera. Um, why? Because we're not, we're not building jobs, we're building careers. Uh, and, and that's, that's, that's just not a, a cliched statement that, that actually is what we do and we have a track record for it. So I think um, people do their research before they apply and, and they come into you know, our hiring pipeline. So in that sense, it hasn't really changed much. The type of people and the caliber of people that we're after, we can still go after and, and their, um, how discerning they are now versus before. I don't think there's been much of a change for, again, for the type of person that we're after, right? Yeah. But has the market heated up? Absolutely, right? So it's a, it's a hot talent market and it's difficult to get, get at, you know, it's difficult to fill our requisitions at the rate that we're growing. That's been a challenge. That's always been a challenge for us, and that's become a little more challenging. But what has changed is how efficient that, how much more efficient that process is. We can hop in and out of interviews, you know, with a click of a button, uh, versus wait for somebody to come in and you know set up, you know, set up, uh, align calendars and and the logistics behind it and all right. Of that. Right. So just you just go through more people than you did before, and that just makes the whole process that much more efficient. So it kind of offsets some of the challenges that we had before, uh, in some sense. So, so um, honest for, for again for the type of person that we're after, it doesn't really make a huge difference. Uh, of course, they experience culture a little bit differently, and we're cognizant of that. Yeah. Uh, and demographically, it's you know I wouldn't necessarily classify younger people as being different as a different kind of breed than than older. I think their their, their relationship to virtual versus in person uh, is it, really a, a very subjective one based on the individual, and we just have to recognize that. That's that's interesting, and 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 one of the things that that we've that we've seen, and I think everybody has seen as part of this this um, you know going virtual, is this realization that you are unconstrained from a hiring perspective, right? If you want to hire a great programmer in Des Moines, there's there's nothing stopping you from doing it because all the tools are there to make that person effective. And when you're when you're 100 virtual, you don't have any cultural issues with in the office people versus virtual people, right? Um, so everybody everybody sort of has the ability to interact uh, with each with each other on a, on equal footing, if you will. That's right. Yeah, Mike. Um, with your portfolio companies, how are they thinking about return to work? But also, does the environment change from a, you know, hybrid, virtual? How do you, you know, how how are how are the, how are they thinking about managing that, and how are you guiding them on that? Well, they're all thinking about it <laughs> without a ton of answers. Uh, it it uh, they've all done surveys, right? This is a vast majority. I don't know if all of them, but the vast majority of companies have done surveys to try to understand. Where their 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 teammates are um, to to a to a company, the older teammates and the younger seem to want to come back. The middle group, typically that have kids, seem to be the ones that are looking for that flexibility, which is completely understandable. Particularly if the kids are in in uh, school, uh, where it's uh, there's uncertainty in terms of that situation. I suspect almost all of our companies will have hybrid. Um, situations from what I'm hearing from the various uh, CEOs and founders um, where there will be significant flexibility, um, but there, there will be a core amount of in-person um, time uh, to, to, to continue to get face-to-face -face and work on, on things. Most of them I hear are, are, are thinking of coming back in, in, in you know, the fall uh, more firmly uh, so far, there are no mandates. There are no vaccine mandates. There are no mandates in that regard. Uh, but there's a lot of work being done around training of mid-level managers and how to deal with hybrid uh, workforce environments. New Spring Capital, we are back. 
uh, largely. It is voluntary, um, um, and 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 more formally after Labor Day as well. But again, even after that, plenty of flexibility, no no rigidity in how it's all going to work. So I suspect that's what will happen for most of the companies that were involved. Okay, great. So John, a, a different question to you. So I, I think when we were all, um, you know, when we were all on before we launched the, the, the webinar, we talked about how I'm excited to go back to conferences again. Um, and I never thought I'd, I'd say that. Um, but, but how do you see the sales and marketing process changing going forward, right? It used to be that you know, in in order to get sales, you get on a you get on a plane and you go meet with somebody and and you and you get a sale. How has so? How do you think the environment going forward is going to be different? Does and how much of it needs to be in person? Um, and does this you know and and what forces people back into travel or 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 does that paradigm of how do enterprise sales, for instance, does that change um, going forward? Okay, uh, all of our companies uh, face that face that issue, but I'll um, start uh, uh, with uh, first uh, on the prior question. We're definitely seeing higher retention rates in a virtual environment. That uh, the people really like it, and uh, and they're not leaving, especially at the mid and senior levels. Uh, so that that is impacting decisions on this. Um, second, on the issue of selling, you know, during the pandemic, uh, we're able to sell to existing customers uh, virtually, able to expand, able to do on uh, services online, training, uh, all kinds of things. And so that's really carried the day in revenue in many, many of our portfolio companies, uh, nearly 100% renewal and 20% up and in, uh, in expanded licenses, all, uh, all done online, all with the existing relationships and companies were more inclined to deal with their ongoing vendors rather than select new ones. So the, the challenge is to break through with new accounts. And that's been a real problem for startup companies and, and getting customers. And so in high ticket items, uh, six figures and above, it has to have some in-person selling to it. And that's just restarting now in, in most industries, but some are still hesitant. Um, and uh, and uh, below that, it's beginning to uh, start to show that budgets are opening up and we are seeing inside salespeople able to uh, make uh, a new business and closing if they have a highly differentiated product right. budget there. So it's really an effort, uh, no different in finding out who has the need, who has budget and figuring out how do you get to them. Pipelines are have uh, one of the things during the pandemic is you could talk to mid-level people, but you couldn't get to the senior people and the mid-level people didn't know if they had budget or priority. That's starting to clear up. And the challenge for us right now is uh, how much do we depend on an uplift? How much do we hire? So most of our companies are cautiously adding sales and service people now, especially if they're really, really talented. But they're, they're still kind of unsure what new business is going to look like in the second half in 2022, but the pipeline numbers say it's going to come together pretty well in most industry segments. All right, that's that's helpful. That's helpful. Um, let's turn. Let's turn to the to the. Well, actually, a, a, a question on um, on on deal environments and and M and A. So M and A going forward and. Um, and again, this is for this is for Mike and Mike and John. It was it was interesting at the beginning of the pandemic, when we were we would work with private equity companies, and they would say, "Hey, I'm not going to I can't close a deal if I can't sit across from somebody, and um, and shake their hand and look them in the eye." Um, ha, just from a from a, a transaction perspective, 
how have you all seen, how do you think that, that, that the M&A world is going to change going forward in terms of how you're evaluating deals? Can you be more scalable? Can you evaluate more? Um, and, and, and how do you think the sort of the new tools and technologies will, will, will change an M&A process and an, and an M&A evaluation? And, and then I'll turn it back to Maria and, and Madhu. Maria, you raised money. Mato, I don't know if you're if, if you're planning on it or not, but I'd like to get your perspective on meeting with folks like investors. But first, let's go to go to Mike and John. Well, it, it was exactly that question last uh, end of March. Uh, how would we handle new deals? Uh, I'll just go to the end point. We've sold eleven or twelve companies since then, uh, and we've invested in uh, across the board probably nine. Uh, and, and look, in a couple of cases, uh, the people buying our companies never even personally met the CEOs or us. Uh, it was really an interesting process. We raised a fund during this period of time. And in most cases, never met the people who are investing in the fund face to face. Uh, we certainly met them over um, you know, Zoom and or Teams many times. Um, I think, at least for us, broadly speaking, um, we will probably look at more deals uh, early on uh, than we were before, just, just because scheduling to meet people face-to-face -face for a first-time meeting was pretty inefficient. An hour call is really efficient, and, and it works well. Uh, and I think we'll, we'll have a bigger pipeline of, of ingestion of seeing things. We, we decided that we, we, we would always prefer to see everybody in person um, and multiple times if you can, to, because you're building a partnership. But during this past year, it became you know, inevitable that you couldn't do that. Um, we prioritized that certain diligence had to be in person. And, and, and the critical question was, if, if the, the, the barrier to entry that we were diligencing or the major revenue stream or, or generation of the revenue stream was something you had to see, um, we, we had to see it. Uh, now, how do we do that? Sometimes we have videos taken of key parts of an operation. In most cases, we tried to get feet on the street to the location, uh, typically driving, because uh, we weren't put, putting people on planes for a while. Uh, so it was an interesting process. So again, we closed a number of deals, deployed a few hundred million dollars of capital during the time, uh, figuring it out. <laughs> I, uh, and I think the outgrowth, outgrowth of all that is we'll do more over Zoom early on go back to trying to meet and build a relationship later on um, and have a hybrid environment, I think is how we will end up doing it. Um, okay. So my view, awesome. I don't know, John, how you feel? Yeah, John, any any different perspective on that? Yeah, I, I have uh, some th things to add. So uh, when it first hit, uh, I thought we wouldn't uh, have many exits. It would be like what happened in the dot-com era. Uh, I, I was chairman of the National Venture Capital Association in 1999, the best year ever in venture capital. It will never be topped with uh, incredible IPOs and things, followed by the worst year in, in venture capital, uh, uh, year 2000. So I was thinking it was going to be like that, where uh, the capital markets for software companies essentially shut down for two or three years. And I didn't think we'd have hardly any exits. And boy, was I dead wrong. We have had about uh, eight or nine exits at a, a slightly faster pace with bigger multiples uh, after the big uh, you know, crash in the first quarter and the, I mean, the second quarter. Um, and you know, we're, we're largely back to normal at the upside. In fact, it's even a, a frothy market. However, it is still very difficult and more difficult to sell a company that's not growing fast. If it's under 20% growth and has a few flaws, it's very difficult to sell without that in-person feeling that the buyer says, I know I can turn this around. I have faith in this management. I think you have to be in person for, for a company that isn't perfect. And so what's getting done in the marketplace today, and one of the reasons there are such high valuations is people are chasing those companies with no flaws and spectacular growth and market opportunity, and they get bid up in the, in the uh, competition. But the bottom half or bottom uh, three, uh, three quadrants, it's, uh, it's difficult uh, now to raise money and difficult to sell 
and there's opportunity in that for, uh, for all of us. I was in the camp that I didn't think I would do a new investment without uh, uh, meeting the people. And I was able to delay that for a quarter or two because we continued to close on companies we were working on for a number of months. Most small venture firms during this period pulled back from, from new deals because they were worried about supporting their existing portfolio. That turned out to be the opposite. Companies battened down their hatches uh, didn't, uh, weren't looking to grow, they were looking to survive, didn't want to lose their financings. So the follow-ons actually went down in most, uh, most venture capital through this period. They're just now coming back and the people are just now considering doing secondaries and other, other sales. So we're, we're certainly um, uh, spending time on, uh, on, on that activity. But I think we're, uh, as far as new deals, I've now done five where I did not meet the management in person. And I, I, I'm still nervous about that. And we'll know in two and three and five years whether that was a, a, a good thing or not. But in all cases, it was in an industry that I knew a lot about. And it was co-investors who were already involved with the company. So it somewhat uh, mitigated, uh, mitigated the uh, the risk, but uh, I think uh, overall the uh, we've done as many or more new investments and less follow-ons. The exact opposite to what I thought at the start of the pandemic. Great, thank you, um, Maria. So you did you did your you did your raise prior to the pandemic. Have you done Have you looked at any capital raising, sort of post-pandemic, and what's that experience been like for you? But that's a very interesting question. So we have, you know, we thought, okay, now we raised the money. It was pre-pandemic. It's going to be hard to raise some more money. But the minute we showed some data, we raised 50 million in three days. And of the story. I mean, that was a few weeks ago. So I was so totally surprised. Congratulations. <laughs> but I think it's what John said. We looked unblemished. Okay, we'll find some blemishes eventually. I, I hope not, but you know, but we just looked really good. However, as an R&D company, we really have two types of interaction. On one hand, it's the investors and the investors have been amazingly nimble at changing to a video. I am totally amazed. On the other hand, we have research. And when you do a collaboration with research, it used to be you go to see them, you discuss, you they come to see you, you discuss, because you know you have to figure out what you're doing. It's not as simple as saying, take a mouse, inject it with boo, and then you see what happens. Um, and that has been really slow. I think it's picking up now because now we can A, do it with, by video. First introduction, what we want to do with the second is going to be by phone. And the third one is going to be in person. And all of a sudden, they're waking up. It seemed like, A, the labs were partially closed. Very often, the animal facility would not start new studies. So if they had an ongoing study, they could finish it, but they wouldn't start a new study. So it became really hard to work with the universities. So that is changing. But investors, I have to say, have been very, very nimble. Great, thank you. And actually, Manu, I want to ask you a, a little bit of a different question. Sure. Um, so your 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 platform is built around financing of equipment, right? Um, how how have how is that market? How, how do you see that market today, right? So so you know when you think about what it, what happened with the market, so an early drop off and then everything came roaring back and tremendous amount of liquidity and money flowing in and banks are lending. How do you see that market today impacting your business and, and has it been changed and, and, and will that market, um, will it evolve based on, you know, how do you see it evolving going forward? Sure. Um... Interesting question in that, uh, first of all, our market isn't very as, as homogenous as it might sound, right? So it, it, because uh, financing happens in all these sub sectors, everything from entertainment to transportation to um, the medical equipment uh, as an example, right? So each of these markets, each of these sub segments um, are affected by, by this change in, in different ways. But what is a lowest common denominator is a definite shift 
to um, subscription-based mindsets, right? So, um, and leasing kind of naturally lends itself to exactly that because you're paying for use of the equipment. But subscription is is qualitatively different than that because you're you're paying for the outcome, you're paying for the experience. As conceptual as that sounds, that's what you're doing. And so there's a big shift that is that is underway in in the market today, and and I, and, and it's going to be super interesting because it 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 absolutely is one of those disruptive changes that that, that is underway, um, and I think it's going to play out over the next uh, five plus years or so. So how it impacts. You know whether whether you're 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 leasing um, aircraft or or whether you're leasing containers or or uh, over the road semis, how it impacts your respective segment, your respective business is going to be is going to be interesting to see. You're going to have to start to look at um, segments as markets onto themselves. You're going to have to start to look at customers as markets onto themselves because how do you extract the maximum value from a given customer? Well, you might have to structure deals specifically for them. Um, based on how they intend to use that equipment. And all of that has to be driven by a lot of anal analytics and data and that's gonna help make that case because you're trying, to find, you're trying to find your footing here on how do you make money in this new environment. Um, so I think, I think if I were to kind of take a step back and look at the forest for the trees, I would say that that's the biggest change that I think we're about to see in, in our space. Okay, thank you. Um, let me, let me uh, switch it up just a little bit. Um, and this is a, a, a question for, for Mike and, and John. So crazy deal environment over the last, you know, really since like the beginning, since summer, right? Nonstop, um, tons of companies coming to market, valuations are through the roof, um, uh, crazy capital inflows. What's your outlook for the rest of the year and, and 2022. John, do you have a silver silver ball? <laughs> well, I, I'm, I'm in the trenches with our companies uh, worrying about how fast we should hire and what's going to come in the door in new business. So uh, it, it really is a company company by company basis of how how uh, uh, fast their markets are opening up and where do they stand. So, uh, uh, but I think generally across the board, uh, there's, there's good room to be optimistic about that. Uh, that our, many of our salespeople think they're gonna hit quota or much higher and they're promising their, uh, uh, their families vacations and other benefits from that. So that, that's the best sign uh, that I see. And there certainly is a, a lot of capital available for top companies. Uh, the, the issue is at the uh, lower end, smaller company that's starting to regrow, that is still challenging with lenders at this point and, and tighter covenants and things. And the lenders wanna see the lead investors and new investors putting equity in. So it's important to have that, uh, that joint financing coming together. And that's part of our role in this marketplace is to uh, architect that. And, and Alan, I, I, we, we're pretty uh, optimistic, you know, about the the market continuing to be, I guess, frothy is maybe a word to use. Um, and that can be good and bad. I think John's right. The top companies they will continue to see opportunities. Um, I think there could be pressure on some of the other business models that are um, maybe not. Uh, as strong, um, and and we'll see how um, inflation or the worth worry about inflation potentially the Fed impact will impact valuations uh, more broadly in the public markets because they, they they do trickle down to the private markets, right? I, I every company that comes in, um, you know, points to his or her potential peer of a public company that's you know a twenty billion dollar value company as the correct number for what their valuation is. And then they may be right. Um, but if there's pressure uh, there, we'll see changes, I, I think, uh, in the private markets. But until cash stops flowing into the public markets, which is what you know, is partly creating such a, you know, a, a you know, increase in valuations, I don't think it's gonna change a whole lot. Some of these business models have you know, changed structurally and they're better. And, 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 and the companies are worth more systemically than, than maybe we thought they were. Question is how much more, right? Uh, feels like it has 
uh, gone a little bit uh, too far in some cases. So um, we've been happily selling at those values. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, not not uh, being you know trying to trying to figure it out on the buy side. Yeah. Well, we, we you know for what it's worth, we we have as well, and and there's sort of a a, a get while the getting's good type of a type of an attitude there from a from the from the you know the Viking bankers. <laughs> um, so as as we as we come to a close, um, just a, a a question that I think would be would be good to to ask Madhu and and Maria, you know, you all you, you're 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 both nominated for for CEO of the year, um, you're both finalists for that award. Congratulations, that's that's awesome. Um, would love to get a sense for, um, you know, what the what the two or three things are that have been instrumental in in your successes as leaders and and builders of of companies um, that and I and I think folks would find that beneficial. So Maria, maybe we start with you. Well, my first and my second company had a very very different trajectory. The first company was VC funded. I have people. We did research. Things kind of we did, in the middle they didn't go so well, but we picked up, and after ten years we sold. So it was, and we made money. So um, I thought it was easy. I mean, other than the middle where we had some problems, but as I said, we recovered. Now, this company was totally different. I started out with a harebrained idea that nobody believed. And pretty much for 10 years, and I'm not exaggerating, for 10 years, I was alone. And people thought I didn't want to hire people. No, guys, I had no money. How do you hire people if you have no money? I put in two million of my own money, and I had an average salary of between twenty-five and forty-five thousand dollars a year. If I hadn't sold my first company, I'd be dead. I'd be under, um, under the, I don't know where. So this was so different for me because I expected this is a great idea. People are going to buy it. No, they didn't. They said, no, no, no. Pharma says this. KO say that. Why? Why do you think you're right? So for ten years, we really, really struggled. And the only thing that kept me going is that I'm really, really stubborn. I was right, period. So then, thankfully, I could prove that I was right, and things have changed. And now we're hiring people. Now we're becoming a company. Now we're going to have a drug. But the first 10 years were so totally different from whatever I ever thought. And I mean, I know I'm stubborn. I just didn't think I would do that for 10 years. Um, so I think that running a company, you have to look at your people, you have to work as a team, but surviving something nobody believes, you just have to be stubborn. And that resonates with me, Maria, as well, because yeah. I've been doing this for, what, 23 years now. Um, you know, Mike and John are probably not going to like to hear this, but I didn't raise any money um, in 23 years. Um, we're swimming against the current there, and that's, we still are. We, we had zero debt to our to our names in those 23 years we had zero outside investment that continues to be the case um that i i think is, is has become a very defining aspect of uh, of our dna as an organization and, and certainly has, has shaped me personally as well in that you have to live and die by the the virtues of your decision i'm, I'm sitting here talking to you guys today because the, the good decisions have outweighed the bad period because it's, a, it's been 100% organic, and therefore there hasn't been a, um, and I don't mean this dismissively, an artificial boosting of an idea, an artificial um, you know, crutch. You, you, you eat what you kill, right? So that mindset is, is actually turned out to be a blessing for us um, in that even today when we create you know, our, our innovation, we have well, a third of the company just focused on R&D, right? A third of the company, which is, which is very uncommon in our industry. Well, why is that? Because when we when we come up with an idea, we want to see it in the wild immediately. We're not building it in a lab. We actually get it out to a customer within the next quarterly release, and we want to see it work because we need to make sure that it works so that it pays the bill. Um, so that mindset, you know, even though we're financially very sound today, continues to define who we are, and certainly has has defined me as well. So so I I, I do um, I, I do relate to some of what you said, Maria, around just being stubborn and, and, and just being in it for the long haul is what that means, I think, in, in the way I interpret that. Um, so it has been a marathon and certainly not a sprint. So that long-term thinking, um, I, I think, gives you clarity and gives you freedom 
to fail in the short run if you needed to. And, and I think that's that really um, is where innovation comes from. And I think ultimately uh, that's that's what marks, I think, companies that make it versus companies that don't it, it is that stubbornness and, and long term thinking. And, and that also kind of permeates us in, in throughout our being as an organization in that we there's no free lunch there you know you got to work for your keep you got to earn your keep you got to think long term do what's right by our employees do what's right by our customers um, and and think you know you're not chasing transactions you're chasing relationships and and that is qualitatively different um, and so that is another aspect so if I were to boil this whole experience of the last 23 years down to just a couple items it would be that. Um, you know, the way we built the organization without any debt, without any outside investment shaped us. And second, uh, the, the importance of long-term thinking um, and, and building for the future um, brings a different mindset um, to the table. So I'll stop at that. Uh, yeah. A few things. Yeah. That's, that's good. That's good. So, so Mike, and, Mike and John, just in, in, you know, in about 60 seconds each, same questions. You you all have invested in hundreds of companies between you. What are the traits or factors that you all see most correlating to success? And let's start with Mike. Um, you know, for us, and we we've looked at it a bunch. It comes down to the, we think three three things. Uh, first and most important is leadership. Um, I, I was, really describes it well. You know how stubborn, how committed, passionate they, they make it happen. We don't. Uh, so you, you have to underwrite the the leaders of that team. Uh, so that's one. The marketplace, you know, it's uh, I once had dinner with Warren Buffett a couple of nights in a row and, and he said, hey, you know, a, a really bit, a really great leader doesn't doesn't really do well in a really bad market uh, with their business. And, and most good leaders don't pick bad markets. But I thought he was right. You know, if a market uh, has a, is declining in size, et cetera, becoming, you know, highly concentrated doesn't help you a whole lot. And then unit economics around certain certain of the business models, product market fit. And, and then certain key key things of how you go to market, I, we think matter an awful lot, but it starts and ends with the leadership team. Thanks, Mike. John? Uh, I agree with what Mike just said. I wish I could follow it all the time, but uh, the, uh, <laughs> the number one for me is the, uh, the founders and management are customer oriented. They're out in front of those customers all the time, selling, ser serving, supporting and they're constantly improving, upgrading their products to uh, stay ahead. And they somehow do it with uh, uh, not all the resources that big companies have and that they're capital and people efficient. And best of all, they create a culture uh, of attracting uh, talent of all ages and all skills that really uh, bond together in the same mission. And you just feel excited every minute you're with that group. Hey, uh, Alan, I want to make one comment, uh, if I can. Uh, yes, just to talk to one another. First board I ever sat on as an investor was a board that John was the chairman of. And I learned so much from John. I literally would come home from every board, come home, come home. Yeah, the office was like, a, I would come to the office with the notes that I had taken and said, okay, we got to do it this way. And they said, well, how'd you know that? I said, John's doing it that way. We got to do it that way. We have to have a board report like this. We, this is the focus that we have you know, customer oriented, market oriented CEOs. I've never had a chance to tell John uh, that because we, we were seldom together. But John, I learned so much from you on that board in Princeton, New Jersey, 22 years ago, I think, uh, that much of the principles in New Spring today, from a governance perspective, were built on those roots. So thank you for your leadership and help. You did well on those principles and developed many of your own. That, uh, that That's I right. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. And thanks, John. And, uh, and Madhu and Maria, thank you as well. Uh, our, our time is at an end. Uh, really appreciate you all joining us and really appreciate the time. And, and thanks for you folks who, uh, who dialed in as well. And let me kick it back to Dean. Uh, I mean, I, I, I'm speechless. The, the, uh, the tremendous insight from you as all leaders and uh, Maria and uh, Madhu, uh, congratulations. <clears throat> as, as finalists, you know that yeah, there was some stiff competition just to become a finalist. Um, and we wish you good luck uh, next week. And uh, John and Mike, um, uh, le legends, true legends within the PAC world. Uh, you'll be joining a new legend, joined by a new legend, Josh Koppelman next week. Um, and we're excited to do that. But again, thank you to all of you. And Alan, to you, uh, to your firm, to Charles Robbins, all that you do for entrepreneurs. 
and this community. Uh, we just are greatly appreciative. Again, in your chat, you'll find the link uh, for next week's program. And we hope that you do uh, register to join us in person on Tuesday evening, and then again, virtually for the actual awards program. Um, I know Maria and Madhu are gonna be tuned in, that's for sure, uh, on uh, Wednesday at 4.30 p.m. So with that, let me leave you to the rest of your day and uh, wish you a wonderful rest of your week. Thank you so much. Bye everybody.